Today on Everyday Injustice, we have Steve Zeidman, a professor, a lawyer, and the director of the Criminal Defense Clinic. And today we're going to talk about the prosecu Prosecutor Accountability Project. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Glad to be with you. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your organization and also what the project entails? Sure. Um, the organization, it's called accountabilitynewyork.org. And what it is, is a bunch of my colleagues, law professors, all of us with experience in the criminal legal system, mostly as defense lawyers at the trial level, the appellate level, we are all too familiar with really unregulated prosecutorial misconduct that has profound impact on people's lives, on communities, families, frankly, on everybody. And that it goes unreported. When it is reported, nothing seems to happen to the individual. So we, with assistance from our good friends at the Civil Rights Corps, uh, undertook a project to look through judicial cases, find where there were actual judicial reported statements of prosecutorial misconduct, uh, and file grievances, seeking that there be some sort of discipline imposed for prosecutors who engaged in ethical and frankly, often constitutional violations. Uh, so Steve, uh, you know, one of the questions I have is, uh, I know in California, uh, the about a decade ago, the Innocence Project and some other groups uh, did a, a research project. And what they found was uh, they were able to kind of similar to what you guys were doing, identify 800 or so proven cases of prosecutorial misconduct. And I think they found something like there were only six prosecutors that were actually sanctioned for those accounts. Are, are you seeing something similar in New York? I identical. And you'll find that you'll find that in every state. You'll find that across the country. And it, you know, I think we we sort of know the reasons. You know, it's lawyers protecting their own because this is all lawyer driven. It's judges when there's some misconduct being loath to report it to a disciplinary committee. And then when it gets to the disciplinary committee, they are, um, let's say reluctant to impose any sort of discipline, no matter how egregious and no matter frankly, how necessary given the great distrust there is in the criminal legal system. So it's time for that to change. That's what's motivating the project. Um, and then I read that, uh, in New York, at least right now, the only mechanism for holding prosecutors accountable is through a grievance process. But I thought um, a couple of years ago, the legislature passed a prosecutorial misconduct commission. Is that not operable at this point? The prosecutorial misconduct commission was born out of exactly what we are talking about right now. A need for some independent organization with teeth and that would actually investigate allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. But what happened was it passed the legislature and the New York State District Attorneys Association filed a lawsuit and they prevailed in part. So right now it's been shut down by the courts um, and hopefully there are efforts to address whatever were the court's concerns. Um, but it was telling that it was fought by the New York State District Attorneys Association, even though it had bipartisan support in the New York State legislature which is very rare in the New York State Legislature. Right. Um, and so, okay, so then explain how a grievance process works. I kind of understand how it works in a labor setting, but how does it work in a prosecutor setting? Well, there, there is a grievance committee. They're set up, there are, they're set up throughout the state. No surprise, they oversee certain jurisdictions, but anybody can file a grievance you have to prepare a complaint. Uh, you have to put in supporting facts to back up what you have to say. And in fact, you know, I think it's important to emphasize here what we've done, the grievances that we filed, these are not all our, our personal opinions. This is all growing out of comments, statements, judicial findings, judges at the trial level uh, on the record saying, this is the misconduct I find here and at the appellate level saying this was improper, this violated an ethical rule, that violated a constitutional rule. It's on the basis of that language that we pulled out and we sent it to the grievance committee citing the precise ethical rule or constitutional 
law that has been violated. That's really all it takes. And then as it goes through that process, um, obviously it hasn't gone this far yet, but right. I, I mean, what's the ho hopeful outcome of that process? You know, the hopeful outcome is that there will be meaningful sanctions. We obviously starting with the step one is that we will find, we hope that the grievance committee will find that there's been a violation. We also believe that the violations are all of very serious magnitude and that it is imperative that the grievance committee, that the sanction reflect just how serious the misconduct was. So when you said before, David, that, you know, it's rare for there to be anybody to be sanctioned. It's not only that it's rare, the few sanctions that are meted out tend to be, you know, the proverbial slap on the wrist. So when you have a set, we, there are cases, some of the grievances we filed, these are people who serve decades in prison who were exonerated because the prosecutor withheld exculpatory material. So in a situation like that, it seems whatever is the most severe sanction, disbarment, for example, seems appropriate. Somebody's life was destroyed. What is the appropriate remedy? Should somebody still be able to practice law after having done that? Um, and one of the things that's kind of interesting to me, um, you know, kind of watching everything is that there's been a big push um, to do something about qualified immunity for police, yeah. but there's been almost no attention to the fact that prosecutors um, have absolute uh, immunity. Can you kind of talk about that and where that comes from? Yeah, it comes from the Supreme Court. And, and the irony about the Supreme Court giving prosecutors this absolute immunity is embedded in that logic was the idea that, well, you know what? Anytime a prosecutor steps out of line or engages in misconduct, we have grievance committees, disciplinary committees across the country that will step in and rectify it. And in fact, you know, I, I don't know if ironic is the right word. Um, the sad truth, the sad reality is that just hasn't happened. So one of the reasons to give prosecutors this immunity the idea that it will be dealt with elsewhere, um, you know, that case is almost 50 years old. So we have 50 years worth of evidence to show that that's just not true. So yes, just like immunity has to be revisited with law enforcement, and in fact, prosecutors are part of law enforcement. The same thing has to happen here. And do you see any evidence that there's any kind of movement afoot on that? You know what I, th you know what I think has to happen I think the focus on police, law enforcement, sort of the reexamination of the entire criminal legal system, it has to, people have to widen the lens and understand that prosecutors are part of law enforcement. They're the ones who sign off on police behavior. They draw up criminal court complaints. They take the police officer's word. They put the police officer on the stand. So I, I, I think we're getting close. I really do. I think it's a moment in time where people are going to say, well, wait a second, um, who actually how many times has this police officer who we've just, you know, we've just discovered had engaged in all kinds of misconduct, how many prosecutors have interviewed this police officer and put that police officer on the stand and never once questioned their credibility? You know, I can give you, if, I'll give you a great example, David. There's um, probably the most infamous detective in New York City, maybe New York City history, is a Brooklyn detective named Louis Scarcella. And he was a homicide detective. And it turned out one case uh, it was discovered that he had engaged in some very serious misconduct, which led to a man being exonerated who was serving life. As a result of that, the then district attorney in Brooklyn said, wait a minute, um, there are 50 other people serving life as a result of cases this detective you know, was in charge of. We need to examine those 50 cases to see if there's serious and similar evidence of making up confessions uh, pretending there were witnesses who really weren't there, that kind of thing. But you know what never happened? Nobody ever said, did anybody look at the 50 prosecutors? How come they didn't question these incredible stories that this detective was telling them? Uh, do I think right about now that we're getting closer and closer to people asking that question, just taking the next logical step? I do. I do. Hopefully our project will help push that along as well. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of situating where the prosecutor is in the system is kind of important here. You know, the people in the know kind of understand that um, while police are important, the prosecutor is actually the most powerful person in the system. Exactly. exactly. And why is that? 
Yeah. Well, um, there, let me answer that two different ways. The power of the prosecutor, it, it is so vast and awesome. And I guess that's part of the reason from our perspective why we need this kind of a project. Because, you know, I know this is going to sound a bit like a, a cliche, but, you know, with awesome power comes awesome responsibility. And to me, the awesome responsibility, what comes with that is the need for transparency and accountability. So prosecutors decide who gets charged with what. Once they dictate the charge, that ties just about everybody's hands as to the appropriate sentence. So certainly at the federal level, judges have bemoaned for years, years, the fact that prosecutors have more power than they do. And since you have that kind of power, it's time for somebody to say, okay, let's be transparent. You know, I'll give you one other example. There's a movement, and I believe in California as well. I know in New York, New Jersey, certainly in the Northeast, to make mis findings of misconduct involving police officers public because they've been shielded by various laws. New York just passed a law as well, which now people can have access to. Whenever there was a, a allegation of misconduct, a supported allegation, you can find it. And now you know what the next question people are asking? Okay, well, that's interesting. I see officer so-and-so had five allegations of misconduct, perjury, uh, brutality. What is being done to that officer? That's the same question we're asking. We want to air out the findings of misconduct, the judicial findings of misconduct, and then say to the grievance committee, well, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, I, I just want to kind of hit this point home about just how powerful prosecutors are. So, you know, one of the interesting stats in the system, which I'm sure you're well aware of, is that, uh, you know, we've really moved away from trials. So 97, 95, whatever the figure is uh, of cases, uh, percent of cases, uh, end up getting put out rather than going to trial. So, in essence, there's almost no check on the power of the prosecutor. Once they prosecute you, you're in the system, and the only way you're getting out is by taking some kind of plea bargain. Correct. And it's the logical thing for anybody in that position to do, whether you committed the crime or not. You know, because the differential between what they're offering you and what you're probably going to get hit if you had the, the nerve, the temerity to make them actually go to trial, the differential, and that's been studied over and over, it's just enormous. You know, one of the cases that we talk about in New York a lot, there was a man who was offered a plea bargain of one to three. Serious question about of guilt. Went to case, the case went to trial. You know what he was, he ended up being convicted, got 20 to life. And you say, how can the same act either be worth one to three or 20 to life? Well, because the prosecutor thought that's what was appropriate. It's, um, it's astounding. And you know, by the way, when you say prosecutorial power, I think just about everybody, not just scholars and academics, Everyone these days, we know there's a crisis of mass incarceration. And more and more people are saying, what was the primary driver? Who was the primary driver? It was prosecutors because of the power they wield. Yeah, and, and just to kind of cap that point, you know, um, the National uh, Registry of Exoneration, you know, has found in, in, in at least in their log, something like 20% of the people wrongly convicted actually pled to uh, uh, the count. Uh, so 20% so of the people wrongly convicted uh, basically took that rather than going to trial. Correct, correct. Yeah, and like I said before, I think it's a logical move because you're just worried about, you know, here's five years if you plead guilty, you're facing 10, 20, 30, 40 or more if you don't. It's a rational decision for people to say, at least I'll be able to spend, you know, more of my life on the outside than the inside. But, you know, there's another part about the pleas that I think is important to emphasize. We were looking at misconduct in judicial findings. So there was a trial, typically, where a judge will say, and we found this rampant in the Queens County District Attorney's Office. That's where we filed most of our complaints. A judge would say, the prosecutor's comments during the trial, in particular in summation at the end of the trial, were improper. Uh, they violated someone's right to remain silent or they just made improper comment. When the problem that you face when you're trying to unearth prosecutorial misconduct is, as you said, David, most cases don't go to trial. So we don't have a record of whether exculpatory material was being turned over. 
we don't have any record of what else the prosecutor may or may not have done. And so for us, this is the tip of the iceberg. These are, these are the only things you can get your hands on are what are public judicial decisions. Too much is buried, frankly, in the plea bargaining process. Yeah, and that, that was going to be my next question, which was, you know, why does misconduct often go unnoticed? And I guess one of the reasons is you never get to the point where it gets on the record. Correct. Yeah, that's to me, that's there. That's, I think, the primary reason. But the other is, as I said before, there's this. You know, it's again, I'm going back to the police. You know, people have said, why don't we have internal affairs divisions to ferret out police misconduct? And everybody realizes you can't have the police police their own. And in many ways, we have lawyers policing themselves. So it's very rare, even when a judge on the record says there's a finding of misconduct, it is exceedingly rare for that judge to refer that prosecutor to a disciplinary committee. It's seen as somehow inappropriate. That's one of the other, you know, bricks we're trying to take out of the wall to say that's why is that inappropriate? In fact, quite the opposite. It's inappropriate when you don't report it because that person should be not only sanctioned by a grievance committee, but you would think that their superiors would want to know, would want to make sure nobody else is doing the same thing, that it never happens again. So the fact that it's underreported is, is um, again, part of what our mission is, is to bring this into the light of day. Yeah, well, you brought up a couple of examples. Um, you know, what you're saying reminds me of a case we covered uh, uh, a month or two ago um, out of Alameda, which is where Oakland is in California. Um, and in that case, uh, the guy was convicted of second degree murder um, in a trial in, I want to say, 2017, so four years ago. Um, it goes to the appellate court and they threw out the conviction, which is really rare, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, based on improper argument uh, by, the, uh, by the prosecutors. So basically prosecutorial misconduct. The uh, trial attorney had actually caught this, filed a motion for a new trial and the judge denied it. Um, the appellate court throws it out. It comes back uh, to Alameda County. The uh, public defender in the case then filed a motion to recuse the entire district attorney's office. Um, mm -hmm. That was denied. Um, it, it went to trial and the guy got acquitted. Um, so it, it, it's a very unique case because it shows at each level uh, where the system falls apart. Guy makes an error. Um, you know, I, I believe the attorney actually pointed it out at the time that he had misstated the law. Uh, the, the judge didn't do anything about it. The judge refused to, uh, you know, set aside the verdict, which they never do. Um, and it was only because an appellate court just happened to overturn it. And believe me, you know, a lot of times, you know, appellate courts will say, um, you know, well, you know, uh, there was misconduct here and there was error, but it's harmless error, um, which uh, is going to be one of my next questions, uh, you know, because you hear this a lot. Well, you know, there's kind of two standards, right? Uh, prosecutorial misconduct that's harmless versus not harmless, but is harmless misconduct really harmless? Yeah, no. It is short answer. No, it isn't. I mean, there's a way in which, it, and just think of it two different ways. The misconduct is the misconduct. The question is, is an appellate court going to say, we think there's substantial overwhelming evidence of guilt anyway, so we're not going to reverse the conviction, but they're not reversing, they're not condoning what the lawyer did, what the prosecutor did. So even in that situation, that prosecutor should face disciplinary action. You know, the example you just gave before, I think the question people should be asking in Alameda County is what happened to that trial prosecutor? What did that trial prosecutor's supervisors do? Other than defend a motion to have the office recused, what did they, did they say, wait a minute, you're a senior prosecutor, this is a murder case, I assume it's a senior prosecutor. How could you have made that comment, that misstatement? Uh, we ought to, now we have to have office-wide training to make sure no one ever does it again. But odds are, if past his prologue, nothing has happened in that office or to that individual prosecutor. David, we've seen prosecutors who've engaged in that kind of misconduct 
You know what's happened to them after it was in a judicial decision? We found out that over the years, they've actually been promoted through the ranks. So we've never- Oh, we've guess what happened to this prosecutor? There you go. Um, I'm not, I'd love to say I was surprised. Yeah, and uh, it's even worse because uh, I think he committed some kind of misconduct in another case that also got thrown out and he still got promoted. Yeah, it's um, it's it's terrifying. And again, it you know I know I'm banging the same drum over and over, but that's why the, we just have to shine a light on this. People have to know when misconduct was committed, and there has to be a meaningful sanction. Otherwise, it's going to continue unabated. It's going to continue as it has for the past at least fifty years. So you know how harmful is prosecutorial misconduct to kind of you know every level of the system from victims to. Uh, defendants to families and communities? Yeah, you know, obviously the impact to the individual is incalculable. So you talk about someone, the example you gave, someone who's convicted who is, you know, innocent because either exculpatory material was not turned over and we've seen too many of those cases or there was improper comment that somehow swayed the jury one way or the other. But then you think about the destruction that just reverberates to that individual's family community and frankly, to the public at large. You know, here in New York, we had a, just um, a couple of months ago, a very high profile exoneration of three men who were convicted of murder. They served about 25 years each. And the judge, it was just a stinging rebuke of the prosecutors in that case, high level prosecutors who withheld exculpatory material, evidence that would have shown that this individual was likely innocent, and then basically deliberately lied that they withheld it. And when you read that and it makes the papers, what does that say to the average person about the integrity of the, of the system? So obviously it affects the individual and their family, but it has to make everybody think that the whole system is a sham. If this kind of thing went on in this case, I, something tells me it's not the only case. You know, and as a footnote to that, David, if I could mention, you know, when I say it's not the only case, the prosecutor you mentioned in Alameda County, you said there was a second case, I certainly hope that the, whatever's the appropriate disciplinary committee, grievance committee in California takes a hard look at every case that prosecutor handled. You know, I'm used to, I was a public defender years ago and I remember prosecutors would say to me when I would say something like, well, you know, he's a kid and he made this one mistake. You know what they always said to me? Oh, you think this was the only time? You think this was just the first time? Well, if this prosecutor has been engaging in this kind of behavior, I hope they would look at every other case that that person's hands ever touched. It's funny, I, I was thinking the exact same thing, just as you said it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's always their line. Uh, yeah, um, well, this is what he got caught for, but I guarantee you he's done a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what does this mean nationally? I mean, obviously, you know, at some point uh, there's got to, there's got to become a, a paper trail, you know, you know, if we use the analogy back to police uh, uh, misconduct, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, Rodney King and, uh, you know, even pre-Rodney King was that there was always a belief in the Black community that police were, were, were beating Black uh, suspects. And, um, you know, that was basically ignored. And then all of a sudden Rodney King comes along and it's on video and, and, and suddenly people couldn't ignore this. But maybe at that point, you know, people weren't really ready to say this is a systemic problem. And so it took Michael Brown, it took Eric Gardner, it, it, it took Laquan McDonald, and, and maybe finally it took George Floyd to really push things in the right momentum. How do we create this kind of paper trail nationally so that people realize just how big a problem this is? Yeah, and I think a lot of what you're saying is shining a light on it. And I know that sounds trite, but speaking very locally, you know, we had three men who served close to 25 years and this exoneration that I'm referring to, it's what I think is astounding about it is one of the men was facing the death penalty. And this sort of misconduct occurred. So this is why it made the headlines all over New York City. And the more we can highlight what went on here, not just that these individuals were exonerated, because in many ways, I think that's 
we get there too quickly because of the important movements of the innocence projects, we get right, oh my God, an innocent person was exonerated. But really what we need to be zeroing in on as well is the prosecutorial behavior and ask what happened to this prosecutor? This prosecutor who was actually seeking to have someone put to death and was withholding information that really clearly indicated that there were other people involved in this murder, not these three men. By the way, he was 19 years old. Not that matters that much, but the whole thing is just mind boggling. So to your point, how does it become, how does it have national resonance? How do we get to a place where we say there's a very serious problem that prosecutors are not being held accountable? Um, frankly, I think it's projects like what we are starting here and what we hope to jumpstart across the country. You know what it is? We could turn the, right now, too often, what you, you get a sense that for prosecutors, the ends justify the means. It's about winning. It's not about trying to do the right thing. It's a police officer drops a case and says, on your lap and says, this guy did it. Instead of saying, well, is that so? Let me kind of unearth every piece of evidence, turn over anything that seems to suggest to the contrary to the defense. It's more like, this is my case and I'm going to win it. And that mentality just has to change. And frankly, I think the only way you change that is by letting people know that if they act differently, they're going to suffer the consequences. To date, no one has really ever suffered the consequences. Yeah, I think, you know, one problem that that you have, and, and actually it, it's the case in policing as well, you know, it's easy to look at the George Floyd case. It's caught on video, it's graphic, uh, it's disturbing, it's hard to defend. Uh, but, you know, there are, you know, somewhere around a thousand people each year that are that are killed by police officers, some percentage of that um, is obviously justified, but uh, too, too large a percentage isn't. But, you know, what that mass is, you know, all the people that police officers beat into falsely confessing. And so instead of getting dead, they end up getting you know 20 30 40 years in prison for a crime that they didn't commit well that's in a lot of ways just as damaging as the death but we don't see that and so right. it doesn't resonate so people can say well you know the you know there are millions of encounters and only a thousand end in deaths it's really not that big a problem and i always say no you're you're only looking at the little tip of the iceberg here but I think, you know, one of the problems that prosecutors have uh, or, or, you know, trying to uh, get the attention of prosecutorial misconduct is a lot of it only comes out well after the fact anyway. Right. Yeah. And, and to me, you know, if I think it's a matter of redefining what a prosecutor's job is. You're right. It, it's how much do I have to look? How much what, what are the limited like where am I? What are my obligations, I guess, is one way to look at it. And if I just get a case, in my mind, it's a run-of-the-mill case. Do I have to question the officer's credibility? Do I have to turn over every document that might cast doubt on their credibility? I think for the most part, people think no. And then, David, you're right. It comes out in two ways. First of all, we need a trial, right? Because otherwise, when there's a plea bargain, things just tend to, this so little is accumulated by way of police reports and the like. So and unless and until prosecutors are willing to kind of say, my job is, it's a corny phrase, the minister of justice. That's what the Supreme Court called it. It's not about winning. It's about doing the right thing, doing justice. Unless and until we get there, I think the majority of this is going to be buried in guilty pleas. You know, um, I, another thought I just had was, you know, um, whenever you see a lot of this police misconduct, there's often a prosecutor right behind them kind of yeah. lurking in the shadows. Sure. So I just uh, did a podcast segment uh, with uh, some of the men that were on the receiving end of the Chicago torture scandal over uh, a couple of decades. And mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that they had is, you know, they, they'd like torture these guys into confessing. And then as soon as they're ready to confess, they send in a prosecutor who then takes the statement. So here this prosecutor comes into this room with this guy bloodied and battered and, and everything. And, uh, you know, he'll like uh, get the guy to make a statement. And sometimes the guy's not ready to make a statement. So they send him out of the room again. They beat, beat the hell out of him for another couple of days. And then he comes back in and the guy's even more bloodied and uh, 
and, and so you could say, well, you know, it's the police, but you know, that prosecutor's looking the other way and he has to know what's going on in that room. Sure, sure, I think that's a great example. And when I mentioned before that Detective Scarcella, this is one, there have been now 15, 15 exonerations, people convicted of murder, sentenced to life, have already been overturned based on his behavior. And you have to say to yourself, where were the prosecutors? Like how, impossible to imagine they didn't suspect something was going on. It was always the same story. It was always the, oh, the confidential informant. It was always the defendant confessed. And yet you have to ask, and I, and I want to put that two ways to you. It's not only what, what was the prosecutor's, um, for lack of a better word, complicity in this, because you really have to have blinders on to say, I don't want to know. But in, uh, in New York in the 90s, we actually had a, a commission looking at police misconduct. It was called the Malin Commission, which was pretty remarkable. But there was something about the Malin Commission that feeds right into the work that our project is doing now. You know, people hear about police misconduct and they tend to think of it focusing, zeroing in on brutality, you know, for obvious reasons, right? Like Rodney King and the cases you're talking about in Chicago. What was fascinating to me was to hear police officers testify that they used to, um, there were so many different types of perjury. This is when they talked about testa lying, a word that's now taken on this meaning. It grew out of the Malin Commission. They talked about trading collars, meaning, David, you make the arrest, but I'm ready for overtime and I'm in the same precinct. I say, give it to me and we'll split the overtime. But that means that I'm making things up on a report that I didn't even see. And the, I know this sounds like it's focused on the police, but my question at the time was, don't the local prosecutors feel embarrassed, humiliated that this was all going on and they never caught it? They accepted everything these officers had to say. They made use of any evidence they obtained. They put them on the stand and vouched for them. So at some point, it's a matter of a prosecutor saying, what's my relationship with the police? Right? Are we hand in glove or am I independent? Hopefully they would view it as independent. Well, and, you know, by the same token, you know, in a lot of these wrongful conviction cases, you know, the prosecutor in most of these cases should have caught it because sure. if they carefully evaluated uh, the statements that weren't adding up, um, they, they would have been able to start asking more questions and more questions would have led them to a different conclusion. And Correct. so, you know, it ends up most of these uh, wrongful convictions, I think, end up being on the prosecutor. They do, they do. And I'll give you another example. Even putting aside the, the dirty cop or the lying cop, one of the examples of misconduct that we found in so many cases, the grievances we filed has to do with misconduct in summation. This is just either improper comment, um, commenting on constitutional, I'll give you the best example. To me, you go to law school, you learn pretty quickly, whether you want to do criminal law or not, that the accused has the right to remain silent. And yet we have cases where prosecutors in their summation are commenting to the jury that the accused exercised their right to remain silent. It's clearly improper. Everybody knows this. And you think, why is this going on? And to me, it's about the culture of I want to win at all costs. And I'm going to do this unless and until I find out people say you can't and they get punished for it they get sanctioned. Otherwise, it's going to continue unabated. And that's pretty much what we've seen. You know, the other way I want to, there's one other example of Queens, which this might, you might find this one particularly interesting. We found two things going on in the Queens District Attorney's Office. And when I say we, this is judicial findings, but this gets back to the, the interplay between law enforcement and a prosecutor. So stay with me, okay, on this one. There was the Queen's District Attorney's Office, it was discovered they had something that was uh, euphemistically referred to as the Chinese wall. So prosecutor number one finds out there's exculpatory information, but makes sure that another prosecutor ends up handling the trial and doesn't turn over that information. So the prosecutor handling the trial, when asked by the judge, do you have any exculpatory information in your file, can say, no. That is astounding. To me, that just highlights that what it's about is not trying to do the right thing, but it's trying to win at all costs. The ends justify the means. I think this person did it, and to hell with the rules, the ethical rules, the constitutional law rules, uh, this is how we operate in this office. And again, that's what I think 
and hopefully what our project will expose. Um, and I did want to make this comment because I, I, I think, you know, we're, we're hitting uh, prosecutors pretty hard and they deserve it. But, um, you know, a lot of this stuff wouldn't be possible if judges would hold uh, uh, prosecutors accountable as well. And so um, they, they definitely uh, share uh, blame in this. Um, you know, I had a um, uh, I was talking to an attorney out, out here in California. He was a private attorney. Um, and he said, yeah, when I get uh, in front of a jury, I win about 80% of my cases. He said, but when I argue a motion in front of a judge, I lose 80% of the time uh, because the judges are not going to go against the prosecutors. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting dynamic there. It really is. And you, you would think that in those rare situations where a judge finds misconduct. I think if you asked an objective person, lawyer, non-lawyer, what do you think the judge's obligations are at that point? I think they would all say you refer it for discipline. Like what job could someone hold? Just think of any job where you're found to have committed misconduct and nothing happens. It's, it's a unique situation and it's a unique situation that impacts other people's lives to such a, a great degree. So yes, I think there's an obligation on judges to be mandatory reporters. They should be the ones referring them to the grievance committee rather than us having to establish this kind of a project. I would love to see them put our project out of business. So uh, as we wrap up here, uh, if, if you could wave a magic wand and, and fix this problem, what three things would, would you recommend? Yeah, first, I would argue, first, I would hope that again, and you hit on the first one, is that judges, there should be mandatory referrals to disciplinary committees when they find that there was misconduct. It's that serious. And I say that because putting the burden on the defense attorney, often they are institutional players where they feel like it might impact their clients negatively if they were the ones raising these charges. So the burden has to feel, has to fall on the, the judge, the judge who makes this finding. Second, the disciplinary committee has to do more than they have done traditionally. They have to, I think, adhere to what the Supreme Court hoped they would do, which is take it seriously and, as a result, impose serious punishment. I think if that happened, if, they, if the grievance committee took the job seriously, and by that I say not sweep it under the rug, but find when there is misconduct, rule that there was misconduct and impose an appropriate sanction, I think that would go a long way to improving things. Those are the three things, David, I would like to see happen. Well, great. Uh, well, I want to thank you for coming on uh, the show. Also, uh, I think we should give a shout out to the Civil Rights Corps. Uh, they do amazing work, and I know they're uh, a sponsor of uh, your project. Uh, Indeed. So, uh, Stick in that. Yeah. Um, so, so thanks for coming on and, uh, and talking prosecutorial misconduct, uh, one of my favorite topics, unfortunately, uh, but we live in this world, right? We do. We do. Keep sounding the alarm, David. All right. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system.